Well, uh, good morning. It's uh, good to see you. It's good to uh, be back. I've had a two-week uh, hiatus, uh, and so it's good to be back. And I just uh, want to start off today by uh, showing you a picture of some very special people in my life. Uh, you've seen uh, these kids before, but these are my grandkids. Emmy, is, uh, she'll be seven in September. Tate uh, is four and a half. And Elijah will be uh, three in August, and Evie will soon be seven months on the 17th of this day. Now, I don't have to tell you how much I love these guys, how much they're a part of my life, uh, how much I love to spend time with them. They are unique and special, just as your kids and grandkids are unique and special. But hanging out with these guys has certainly taught me some things over the years that uh, I had forgotten about raising my own kids. My two daughters are 32 and 30, so when you have grandkids, especially when you have all four, you, you kind of relearn some things maybe that you forgot. So number one on that list is the necessity of naps. Uh, not for them, for me. <laughs> uh, I tell you, uh, they, they, uh, they're fun, but all four of them together in the same day, it kind of wears you out. But no, that, days just go better when the younger ones take naps. You know that, and you will experience that. Uh, I had some props up here, and I don't know what happened to them. But anyway, uh, a change of clothes. That's something else I learned, how important it is to have a change of clothes. Uh, diapers, specifically in the diaper bag. You only have to make that mistake fatal mistake one time before you make sure you have a change of clothes and have plenty of diapers. Uh, the power of five ounces of milk. Uh, amazing. You know, up in Ohio, my mom uh, lives up there, and so I go up there to see her and take the kids up when I go. But I made that fatal mistake, I think it was with Tate, one time. Uh, I didn't take enough milk, and it was a long ride home. Uh, also, they've taught me about schedules and plans. Uh, just interruptions happen. Uh, as I said, going up to Ohio, there's several times that I want to get back. You know, I'm the guy and I'm wanting to get home. And just if they have to go to the bathroom, you can hold it till we get home. But no, no, sometimes you got to stop. You got to stop and go to the rest area. You got to stop and go to the gas station. You got to stop and feed them because uh, they're not on my schedule of feeding. I'm on their schedule of feeding, especially the little ones. And then this last one. Uh, that I think I've had to relearn is just how hard it is to share. How hard it is to share. For whatever reason, sharing, do you notice, does not come natural. It's like we're born with this instinct, mine, mine, I'm not going to give it away. You know, and it's not just human beings that have this issue with sharing. Look at this video and see who else has problems with sharing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter for a baby dog, baby cat, baby boy, or baby girl, sharing does not come natural. We learn so, so very young to hang on tightly to what we have. For instance, I challenge uh, any of you to go down to the two and three year old class downstairs and take out that uh, cup of Cheerios they have, that toy or that book they have in their hands. I challenge you to do that. And let me say this, uh, I know it's not going to end well for you if you do that. It's funny, even though we tell our children and tell our grandchildren about sharing, you need to share. Even though we say those words, where do we find them still at the end of the day? Do we see more of this? Here, you take this. Or more of this. I'm going to keep this. 
Do we hear more of here, you can play with this, or more of that's mine, give it back. Mom, Jimmy took mine, whatever. I think you know which we hear more of. The facts are sharing is a hard lesson to learn. And I'd like to be able to tell you today that it eventually gets better. I would like to be able to tell you as we get older, sharing becomes more natural. I would like to be able to tell you that as adults, we have no issues with sharing. I would like to be able to tell you all those things, but you know as well as I do, I would be lying if I said that. Truth be told, even though we know better, even though we've been taught better, even though we understand all too well how we feel when others don't share their toys with us, we all still have trouble with this word, sharing. And what's amazing is this issue of sharing is not just exclusive to those outside the church, uh, those in the world. You, you could understand maybe why they might uh, have a problem with sharing. Uh, but for us who have been enlightened, for us who have the Holy Spirit within us, within the church, for those who are followers of Christ, we too have issues with sharing. Sharing is just as much a problem inside the church as it is outside. You need a few examples? Let me give you a few. For instance, where we sit. Where we sit on Sunday mornings. Uh, have you ever got mean mugged by somebody because you took their seat? Uh, maybe you've had somebody come up to you and say, you're in my seat. And uh, that goes well for visitors and guests, doesn't it? Yeah, they want to come back. How about our classrooms? How about our Sunday school classrooms? All right, you know, a lot of people, believe me, I've had more issues with this here, with classrooms at Broadway, with any church, than, than a lot of other issues that you think I would have problems with. People don't like to share. Boy, they know if, you've, uh, if you haven't put their furniture back in the right way. Uh, everything here is everybody's, and that's what we need to look at. So where we sit, our classrooms. How about this? How about the spotlight? We, uh, we don't like to share the spotlight with other people. Some preachers don't want uh, anybody else up here to preach uh, because they want, they want to be up here. They want that spotlight. They don't want to share. And, and, and certainly for me, I want to share this. That's why I have Mark preaching, Doug preaching, other people coming in preaching because it's not, it's not about me, all right? It's about the message. It doesn't matter how old we are sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes we Christians don't like to share our toys. For instance, some people here, some people are upset because of the service times changing. Now, uh, I just had one person mention to me this morning. Now, what I don't understand is in that we're getting out at 1130. That's actually earlier than we're getting out anyway. You're having Sunday school at 9. Church starts at 1030. We're getting out at 1130. Same time, really, if not earlier, so I don't understand that. But the problem is, we don't want to share. We don't want to share this. So today, we kick off a new series called I Love My Church. Throughout the month of the July, we're going to be looking at four specific characteristics which need to be on full display around this place so we can all say, I love my church. Now, our hope is that we will all better wear these four characteristics on our hearts and our words that we say and display them in our lives so that we can be the kind of church that brings joy to the Father because sharing, a sharing church brings joy to the Father. So today we start off with focusing on the characteristic of sharing. And the reason we picked this one first is because if you think about it, if we don't do this one right, how in the world are we going to do the other ones that we're going to talk about? How in the world are we going to be able to serve others well if we don't understand sharing? How in the world are we going to be able to live in community with other people if we don't share? How in the world are we going to be able to give to others if we don't learn to share? So if we all want to be able to say that I love my church with enthusiasm, and I think that we all want to say that, if you don't want to say that, come have a conversation with me afterwards because I want to talk to you. Then we certainly have to learn this important characteristic of sharing. And, and why? Why is sharing so vital for the church? Uh, let's look at a few reasons. Number one is this. Sharing is vital because it puts the focus on the other person. It puts the focus on the other person. You know as well as I do that more times than not, we, it, we, we have to admit we are selfish in nature. Simply put, we like things our own way. You know, I like things my own way. I got to be honest. Now, I know some people in the church, let me give you an example of this. Some people in the church have sold a business. 
They sold their business, and they were type A leaders. But now somebody else is calling the shots in those businesses, and it's hard. And they're still working there. Part of the contract is that they're still working for this company, and it's been hard for them because they're not calling the shots anymore. The focus is off of them and on the new person, the other person. And church, isn't that the real issue when it comes down to it? Is the focus, we don't like to share because the focus becomes off of us. As I think about sharing, as I think about how vital sharing is for us to be the church that Jesus Christ wants us to be, I think about these words from the Apostle Paul. He lays it out, I think, pretty straight on this topic of sharing when he says this, do nothing. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the others. And I want us to look at this verse. You tell me, church, what's it say? Do what? Do nothing out of what? Selfish ambition, all right? Or vain conceit. Rather, in what? Humility. How are you supposed to value others? Value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the others. You want a life verse to live out? <laughs> Let this be your life verse to live out. Because honestly, it is hard, isn't it? It is hard to live this verse out. How hard is it to do nothing out of selfish ambition? In your home, at work, here at church. How hard is it to value others above yourselves? How hard is it to not look at your own interests, but always look at the other person's interest? It's tough, isn't it? It's tough to live this verse out. It's tough to remove me from the equation. And, and let's face it, why have there been so many issues within the church? Why have some left the church? Why have there been so many church splits? I think it comes down to these two things. People have not learned to share well. We want our own way. No matter what it is, we want our own way. So, Remember, it's vital because sharing is about the other person. Number two, sharing is also vital because it's about the relationship. As we've discussed over the past couple of years, Jesus didn't just tell his disciples what to do. Jesus showed his disciples what to do. He intentionally invested in his disciples. He, he, he would take them away and spend time with them and teach them and hang out with them. He shared his life with them. And that's what Jesus did. And so fast forward to the book of Acts when we see the church begin. And look what, uh, look what is right there at the beginning of the church of Acts. Look at what the church of Acts was doing. All the believers, okay, all the believers were what? One in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them, all that there was no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the cells, and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Now, as I think about that, can you imagine living in that type of community? Can you imagine that here we have 200 and some people here today and that we all would just pull our resources into one pot and that we would all live? If there's anybody needy, that we would take care of them just like we would anybody else. Imagine what that was like. Do you see how sharing was a normal way of life for the first church? You see how me was out of the equation in the first church, in this scripture, in the book of Acts. And so my question is, where did it go wrong? When did it go wrong? When did it turn south? And I, I would say it, it would be this. I bet it was when people started putting their own needs before others. I bet it was when they started defending, uh, depending on themselves rather than the Holy Spirit, because you can't live like they did in the book of Acts by depending on yourself. That's, that's a Holy Spirit thing, to be able to live like that. And, and church, let me ask you this. Could it be that we don't experience God's grace powerfully like the church that said there in, in Acts in our lives because 
we don't share well? Could that be the issue? You know, I want us here at Broadway to be a church that shares. And we have, but we have, we have some issues. I want us to share well. I don't want us to share like the Geico commercials, just okay. All right? I want us to share well. I want us to be willing to let go of our time and share it with others. I, I want us to be willing to let go of our resources and share it with others. I want us to realize more every day to hold on loosely to what we have and be willing when the Spirit says, give it up, that we will give it up, that we will follow His voice. So why? Why do we need to do this? Why do we need to share? Because we value relationships. That's why we share. We value relationships. And one of the relationships that I have come to value is our relationship with Assurance for Life. Assurance for Life has been serving the needs of young men and, and women in Central Kentucky who face the challenge of an unplanned pregnancy. They've been doing this since 1985. More than 4,441 children are alive today uh, because their parents found the help and the hope they needed through assurance. This year marked the 18th year of our Bobby Wilhoy Golf for Life. It's an annual golf scramble that we do to raise money for assurance. 18 years. And over the past 18 years, uh, through a lot of your efforts, God has blessed us to raise close to $150,000 through a golf outing in proceeds to assurance. And let me tell you this, it's not just about the scramble. It's not just about the golf. It's about the relationship. And that's why we keep hosting this golf scramble. That's why you keep uh, giving money to be a whole sponsor. That's why you keep showing up to golf in it. Uh, most of our golfers are repeat golfers because they love what, what this, this golf scramble is about. So many people mark this date on their calendars to be a part of this date. So I'm pleased to, today to introduce to you Rhonda Weber. Rhonda is the Director of Assurance for Life. And Rhonda, I want you to come up here. I want to present you with a check from our proceeds from this year's term for $9,100. Thank you. All right, give her. Now, most years I just present the check. Rhonda smiles, says a few words, and goes home. But because of our relationship, I wanted to give Rhonda a chance to explain to you because we share with her what assurance is able to do in sharing with others. So I'll give Rhonda some time here to talk about that. Thank you. I want to start by saying thank you. Thank you for everything that you do through the Golf for Life, the baby bottles, volunteering your time at our center, your prayers. Um, it is all precious to us, and I'm excited this year to have a chance to share just a taste of the impact you make in the lives of our clients when you choose to share well with assurance. Um, I could go on for days, so I made myself a few notes. Um, of just the first things that came to mind about the difference that your sharing makes. Because you share with us, we are able to step into the crisis and share a physical, emotional, and spiritual space with our clients. Sometimes the most powerful thing we can offer them is to be with them in that storm so they do not have to pass through it alone. In Scripture, we are called to carry each other's burdens, to weep with those who weep, to confess our sins to each other, and pray for each other. Proverbs says, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. Our clinic is a place of refuge to those who are likely experiencing one of the scariest times in their lives. Our staff and volunteers are able to stand in that crisis with them as the hands and feet of Jesus, listening, caring, praying, and loving them more than any choice they have made or will make. It is your support of our ministry that makes that possible. Secondly, because you share with us, we are able to share truth with women and men who are facing unplanned pregnancies in our region. Our caring, sensitive, and professional staff compassionately walk our clients through critical truth in a sea of deceptive cultural messages. We provide accurate information on all options, and also we reveal through the power of ultrasound the truth that she is carrying a whole, separate, unique, living human being. It is your support of our ministry that makes it possible for women and couples to make life or death decisions for their families grounded in truth. That is what real empowerment looks like. 
Another key component of what we're able to share with our clients is practical help. Through the program, Assurance itself offers those who choose to parent and our staff skillfulness at connecting clients to a beautiful network of other organizations in town who stand ready and willing to offer real and important assistance. We help break through the barriers to keeping the child. Most women have abortions because they feel like they have no other choice. We provide the information, emotional support, and practical help they need to be able to care for themselves and their families. It's your support of our ministry that makes this possible. Lastly, and most importantly, thanks to you all, we are able to preach gospel to our clients. No matter their presenting situation, like me, what they need most is Jesus. Jesus is hope in all circumstances. Jesus makes a way where there seems to be no way. Jesus forgives, heals, brings freedom from past sins, and importantly, in the case of our post-abortive clients, this includes sin of abortion. Your support of assurance means that on a day, a woman and man in our community feels more overwhelmed, scared, alone, ashamed, and hopeless than ever before, we can offer them the best news of all, the gospel. Last year alone, our staff and volunteers engaged with 640 conversations with clients about their spiritual beliefs. We presented the gospel explicitly on 93 different instances to our clients. It is your sharing that makes that possible. I'll force myself to stop there um, in terms of examples, and I will end with a report of what all that sharing leads to. Last year, God saved 145 lives from abortion through assurance. And already in the first half of this year, another 69 babies have been saved. They will take their first breaths. Their mothers and fathers were spared the very real trauma of abortion. Generations were changed thanks to the ripple effects of your sharing with uh, assurance. Thank you so much and God bless. So do you see how sharing is, is vital because it's about relationship? The last thing that I want to talk about this morning is sharing is vital because it ultimately shows uh, love, our love, to the world. We can't talk about sharing without mentioning this last point. Let me again use some of Paul's words to drive home what I want you, you to leave with today. Paul said to the church in Thessalonica these words, Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives, our very lives as well. Notice what Paul says here in regards to sharing. There are two things that he mentions in this verse. Number one is shared the gospel. We shared the gospel with you, but we also shared our lives with you. And I think this is so important. I don't want you to miss it today. If all we do is just help people physically with their physical needs, social justice things, and not share with them their real need, the message of the good news, then we have missed our target. We have missed our mark, church. Carl Henry said the gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. I've used this quote by St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, he says this, I preach the gospel and sometimes I use words. Now I understand the depth of what he meant there. I understand what he was trying to portray. I've used that quote, as I said, in sermons, but let me say this, we gotta use words. <laughs> we gotta use words. We gotta love people. We gotta do the acts of love, but we gotta use words. Some of the last words Jesus said to disciples were this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now over the years, I've gotten to go to a lot of places, a lot of, a lot of places. And, and just let me say, going to the ends of the earth is exciting. As most of you know, a team of us just got back from Spain. Matt, my daughter, Matt Marsh, and my daughter Ann, we got back last Sunday night at 1030. Uh, Michelle and Linda stayed over another week. Uh, Michelle and Linda did not make it home uh, last night as they were supposed to. They're stuck in New York City because of the storm, so they won't make it home till, uh, till tomorrow. But it's always exciting to go and see 
uh, these places. Go and visit with the missionaries and walk where they walk and live as they live. And, and the Spain trip was, uh, was just phenomenal. We had a great time. We worked with seven and eight year olds, nine and 10, 11 and 12, 13 to 15 year olds, boys and girls of all ages. We taught them English. We taught them Bible. We had crafts. We had music. We taught them basketball. Uh, we just had a, had a great time. And it was hot. It was hot here, I know, but it was a hundred and some degrees over there as well. But I it's life changing. You want to know the impact of people going to the ends of the earth? Just ask any of the people that were on the team, and they will be able to tell you it was life changing for them. But I want you to notice in this verse in the book of Acts that Jesus Jesus talked about. He said this. He he mentioned a place first. Where did Jesus say to go first? You will be my witnesses. Where? In Jerusalem. He listed Jerusalem first. Why is that? Jesus said to go to Jerusalem because everybody can go to their Jerusalem, right? Everybody can't go to Spain. Everybody can't go to Jamaica. Everybody can't go to Kenya, but everybody can go to their Jerusalem, your hometown. Jesus knew that, and that's why he said that. And, and I think of some stories in the Bible. In Mark chapter 5, you have the story of the Gadarene demoniac. And you remember, Jesus healed the Gadarene demoniac, cast out the demons. And the, the, what did the Gadarene demoniac want to do? He wanted to go with Jesus, didn't he? He says, let me go with you. And Jesus said, no, you stay here. And his point was, you stay here in your hometown. In John chapter four, Jesus met a woman at the well and he, he talked to this woman. He found out more about this woman. At the end of that story, I just want you to look at it, what it says. I think it's in verses 37 and 38. It said, many people came to be followers of Jesus because of that woman's testimony. And as I think about that, church, I think about us. We need to share physically and help people physically, but not leave out the message of the good news. Jesus helped that woman physically, but he also helped that woman emotionally and spiritually. The message of what Jesus has done for you is what you need to tell. And so many times we don't talk about that in the church. So many times we don't act out that in the church. You have a story to tell because of what Jesus has done in your life. And, and I hope that you will understand that Jesus wants you to tell that. Paul says we are Christ ambassadors as if he was making his appeal to others through us. And so that's why we see Jesus said in Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Why do we go into all the world? We go to Jerusalem, but we go into all the world because Jesus said to and, and proclaim the gospel. Jesus said in Matthew 19 and 20, the um, great commission, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. And Jesus said in Luke 10 too, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. You know, when Jesus said all those things, I believe fully that he wasn't just talking to his disciples. He wasn't just talking to pastors when he said that. He wasn't just talking to elders when he said that. He was talking to each one of you here today. Each one of us is commissioned by Jesus to go and be the salt on this earth. We are all called to go, and you need to understand that. Tim Harlow, pastor of Parkview Christian Church in Chicago, he reminds us of this crucial point when we talk about being the salt of the earth. He says salt can't work unless it's correctly applied to something that needs it, right? Mashed potatoes, we put a little salt on. He says not enough salt and it's bland. Too much salt, though, together in one place is at best useless and at worst disastrous, we're not supposed to clump all the salt, all of us up into one place. We're supposed to go. Do you understand that analogy today? Let me ask you, when was the last time you thought about the eternal destiny of the people around you? As you go to the store at Kroger, Walmart, as you go to Waffle House, Cracker Barrel, wherever you go to eat, as you go to the gym, you realize right now that our country makes up one of the largest mission fields in the world. The sad truth is that other countries are sending missionaries to the United States. There are roughly 195, 195 million people who don't go to church right now, right here in our own country. 
The percentage of Americans who don't claim any kind of religious worldview has gone from only 15% in the 1950s to 60% in, in uh, 2010. That's quite a jump, isn't it? So let me ask you, do you know your neighbor, your lost neighbor? Do you know the waitress that where you go to work, uh, to eat? Do you know your coworker who's lost? They need you. They need to hear the message of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God has put you in that perfect position to be able to tell them the good news. And so let me encourage you as we close out today to pray this prayer just every day and see what God does with this prayer. Pray, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would put somebody before me this day who needs to hear about you and the life-changing message of the gospel and help me to be faithful to speak those words to them. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you so much for your word. God, I thank you so much that... uh, Um, for you sharing with us. God, you didn't have to, this whole subject of sharing and and giving what is yours to others. It's exactly what you did. You didn't have to give us love, but you did. You gave us a great love. And it was uh, just such an example was given to us in your son through what he did on the cross for us. Jesus said, you lived this life. You were not about yourself, but you shared everything with others. As we see in the book of Acts, as the church started, we see the importance of sharing how it started out to how it is now. Father, help us to see the importance of removing ourselves from the equation and allowing you to come in and to fill that selfishness with selfless love. God, that we'd be able to share with others we'd be able to give stuff away hold on loosely to those things that we have god that we'd be about relationships and intentionally investing in others so that we can all all ultimately share with them the good news put this upon our heart burden us with us wake us up at night so that we feel this god and we sense that you are leading us to say something to somebody I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.